Greetings and welcome back to my channel, World War II Books Where to Start. I'm your host, George S. Patton, Commanding General, 3rd Armored Division. You can call me Old Blood and Guts, reporting live from somewhere outside of Metz as we assault the fortress. Alright, today we're going to take a look at some more memoirs from World War II to get you into the topic of the Great Conflict. The big change in the 20th century has altered history forevermore. So if you find the topic of World War II a bit overwhelming, but want to find a good entry point, and you're fascinated or at least interested or have a curiosity about the conflict, here you go. I find personal memoirs is a great way as a small slice of the conflict to get into the bigger, broader picture and kind of get your feet wet and figure out what's going on. So uh, part two of the uh, memoirs here. We're going to go with a modern one put out in 2014. And I'm kind of cheating here. This is kind of like a biography, more slash memoir but more of a biography because it's by Lauren Hillebrand but it's about Louis Zamperini and it's called Unbroken and if I show you the cover you may have seen this in a used bookstore somewhere because there's a million gajillion thousand hundred kabillion copies of this thing running around right now and that may have sparked your interest why there are so many copies of this thing running around is it that bad no it's that good but not everybody keeps their books you know they move on and it's uh, got every iteration you got a, you got a, even got a juvenile um, version for um, young adult readers out. It kind of softens it up a little bit. This is the full-blown regular adult edition. And uh, they made it to a movie, too. Directed by, of all people, Angelina Jolie. It was okay, so-so, not great, nothing to write home about. And it won't give you the full flavor of what uh, Louis Zamperini went through and his story. He's uh, one of those guys that shouldn't have survived uh, what he did. So, um, he was a wild child in the 30s, uh, totally ungovernable, a teenage delinquent, a juvenile delinquent was what the term would be in the 70s when I was growing up. Uh, maybe a hooligan would be what was, would be have, uh, would have been applied to him in the 30s. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, one of those guys that uh, could have done some time in the local Huskow for uh, all his crazy stuff. And his parents had no grip on him. It just totally, it just a wild child, totally ungovernable. You know, smoking and drinking at an early age, which you would not find that uncommon in the 30s, honestly. Uh, but uh, he turns himself around courtesy of his brother and, and turns into a long-distance runner in high school. And he's pretty good at it, um, to the point where he eventually makes the Olympic team. He's trying to, he was trying to uh, be the first guy to run a four-minute mile. He never did achieve it uh, because of an injury. But he was on the Olympic team in uh, 30... 36, yes, the, the most famous Olympics, the only one everyone, any, only Olympics anyone really ever remembers because of Jesse Owens and the Nazis, right? So this is in Berlin, Summer Olympics, and he's part of the track team. Now, he ate himself into a stupor on the way over because there was no modern nutrition coaching, you know, that we we have now for athletes. You know, they were pretty much on their own. A couple of the high-profile guys might have had their own personal coach, but Zamperini was on his own. And he, being a depression year child, he just ate and ate and ate because, hey, the food was there. He never had this, seen this much food in his life. So he was pretty much out of shape by the time the event started. But he did manage a nice comeback in his particular event to the point where he was noticed by Hitler himself. And he got a brief meet greet with Hitler after the, after the event. Imagine that. Then he goes out on the town that night and gets a little crazy and ends up getting um, kind of detained by the uh, Nazi guards. He was trying to swipe a flag as a personal memento take home to the folks and that didn't go over so well so we kind of got a little bit of a dip amount of trouble we'll go out of that so then by the time the war starts we take up the story he's been drafted in the army air forces and he's a, a navigator on a b-24s in the pacific on a couple no-name islands way out in the middle of nowhere where we just have garrisons to uh to patrol against japanese subs and to keep our communications open on the stepping stones towards australia and on a search and rescue mission one day for another crew that went down the previous day, his B-24 conks out with engine trouble. And down the drink they go. So the B-24s are terrible planes to attempt to land on the water because of their, their high wing. Um, when you strike the water, it's just fuselage. There's no support underneath. And you just, most times it does not turn out well. So they had, I believe, 10 crewmen on board and only two got, three got out. Zamperini, uh, his buddy, was, I think was the co-pilot or pilot, and a gunner, I think it was. And they pop a life raft open, and then there they are with a box of chocolate bars and a whole lot of ocean and a whole lot of sunshine and no clue what to do. That's the beginning of the uh, the awfulness, and it's just utterly, utterly captivating. You'll blaze through this book. Um, 
and it really just just feel everything he went through. So uh, that's the beginning of the bad. It's not the end of the bad. He, by the by the time they wash up on a, a Japanese um, or found by a Japanese patrol boat thirty some days later, they should all one the one guy did die. They should be dead too. But they get the, the misfortune to be captured by the Japanese. And so for the next two years until the end of the war, they are tortured and uh, worked almost to death in Japanese POW camps. So it, it's it's just amazing what a, a person can endure if they have the willpower and a little bit of luck, maybe a lot of bit of luck in this case. And and then it also will cover his post-war life uh, up until uh, the writing of the book. He he just passed away like two years ago, or maybe a year ago. And he was a really long live guy. A uh, fantastic story I can't recommend highly enough. Five stars all the way. Unbroken by Laura Hillebrand about Louis Zamperini. And second up today, we're going to have With the Old Breed, at Pelu and Okinawa by Eugene Sledge. Uh, first published in 1981. Uh, 315 pages. It's kind of slim, but there's a lot, of, a lot of detail here. This is not as fast to read because um, he really gets into the horror of being surrounded in combat by the stench of decaying bodies, the stench of the battlefield, and no sanitary uh, conveniences whatsoever. You're on hard coral surfaces and extreme heat, debilitating heat, um, and the bullets are, are, are sinking all around you and, and the mortar shells are dropping in, and this is your daily grind uh, dealing with this. No sleep, just constant artillery and machine gun and rifle fire and Japanese infiltrators at night. Yeah, fun way to go right here. This is a uh, this is a uh, combat at its grittiest right here. And he was a mortar man. He wasn't a rifle man in the front lines, but even the more man, you, you never know what the Japanese are going to pop as infiltrators and jump in your foxhole at night and try to stab you to death or pop a grenade on you. So this is the kind of thing he had to endure. Uh, he only went through two campaigns, so the, the the fighting in the Pacific was really broken up island by island, obviously, as opposed to a long drawn out land campaign like in Europe or Russia. But those island campaigns, as brief as they were, could be an eternity to those involved. And, you know, they're you know, usually one or two divisions involved. They were hit with very few reinforcements, of any, and they had to make it happen. And they did. Uh, there was never an instance, I don't think, in the entire Pacific War where we had to abandon uh, an island after we uh, made an amphibious assault, which is an incredible record. I think we made over 100 amphibious landings, Army and Marines, in, in the Pacific in uh, the Second World War, and never failed. That's pretty phenomenal. Um, so, uh, as bad as Peleliu was, and it's got a you know, fearsome reputation for an awful battle for a piece of land we ended up not needing. Uh, the war kind of bypassed it, went in a different direction, and still got you know several thousand Marines killed. Unfortunately, its only saving grace was that it helped in the search and rescue of the uh, Indianapolis survivors uh, after it was sunk by a Japanese submarine late in the war. After that, Sledge gets to go to Okinawa for 90 days of hell where it's, if anything, a little bit worse. Um, there's a famous moment in here where he's, uh, his platoon sergeant has told his, his guys to dig in where they are and uh, on this slippery volcanic slope, and they're dig shoveling out this volcanic soil, and he hits something that emits a terrible smell, and he's like, oh my God, what is this? But the shell fire's coming in, and machine guns everywhere. He's got to get, he's got to get, in the, he's got to find a foxhole. So he keeps digging, and it turns out it's, it's a rotting Japanese corpse. And he tells, he tells Sergeant, man, I can't do this. And Sergeant, you get down in that hole if you want to live. There's war right there. Bam, right in your face. That's what it is. Um, doesn't sure of anything. And he's, he's very good at relating the, the moral uh, dubiousness of, of the situation he's in and, and the pathos of those around him, and, as well as a couple of black humor instances, you know, like one where he was tapped out on a stretcher, just exhausted, passed out for sleep. Somebody put a tarp over him. And the Graves registration team thought he was dead and went, went to haul him away. And he hops up, you know, corpse from the uh, revolving from then scares the hell out of everyone. So a bit of black humor in there to kind of line things up. But with the old breed, it, it's, a, it's a great memoir for a rifle, uh, you know, guy in a rifle company doing his job. Um, and then to finish up today, we're going to switch kind of tracks to go naval. With a Japanese destroyer captain by Captain Tomichi Hara. First published in 61. This is also a brief one, 308 pages. Bit of a fast read, but if you go too fast in this, you might miss some details because, um, especially in the early going in 42, when he's uh, with the um, forces invading the uh, southern resource area, as, they, as the Japanese call it, all, uh, the 
Borneo and um, Java and all that. A lot of intense naval action there, all to the Japanese credit. They, they want everything down there. A lot, of, a lot of small details you might miss if you don't go back and reread a couple paragraphs. There's one little incident where he says uh, he, he or, a, or a, a lookout spotted a glowing ember of a cigarette from a couple miles away on the surface. Went to investigate it and attacked a submarine and pounded it with depth charges to get some oil to come to the surface. And they were pretty sure they killed it. They had no means of verification and they didn't hang around to make sure um, the kill was real. Uh, I don't even think that particular story had sonar. So it was just a sighting uh, of a cigarette that led to this attack. And while the attack was did damage the sub, uh, post-war records show that I think it was a Dutch sub that did survive and limp away. But Hara had no way to know that uh, because the orders were to stay with the convoy or whatever uh, he was, his task was. So they, the Japanese Navy credited him with the kill. That actually didn't happen. Kind of common in the war, too. Uh, submarine kills were oftentimes elusive, especially in the early war, to confirm that they actually went down. Uh, he was a peripheral combatant at Midway. He was in the uh, in, uh, 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 destroyer of screening the uh, actual invasion force to the south Midway. So they had the PBY attacks against him, but that was about it. But his real uh, claim to fame was in the 43 with dealing with skip bombing and all the supply runs uh, to the various little outposts that Japanese were trying to hold on to. And uh, he actually devised the uh, torpedo technique for the IJN pre-war. He was uh, something of a mathematical whiz and worked out the firing patterns for their long lance torpedoes that contributed so much to the success during the war. It wasn't just that the weapon was good. It was the doctrine behind the firing and, and you know, their, their, their pattern of their spread and, and how they would uh, conduct the attacks at night that led to such success and, and such fear on the American side of the long lance torpedoes. And Hara was on, one that did the, the donkey work on this. He did the heavy lifting. So his, the IJN's success was largely due to his, um, his diligence pre-war. Um, late war... As they shrink, the Empire shrinks back to the home islands. He's given command of a light cruiser and takes part in the, the uh, one-way suicide mission of the Yamato. And his cruiser is sunk, and there he is in the water at the end of the war and of his career. And uh, he kind of cuts it off there. Not much about his post-war life at all, if anything. Um, but this, again, for an enemy view, uh, viewpoint of former enemy, um, something kind of unusual, a destroyer captain. You would normally associate that with... Uh, British destroyer captains doing escort duty against uh, German U-boats in the Atlantic. And so this is pretty val valuable. There aren't many memoirs that came out on the Japanese side. There's just a handful that I'm aware of. And, and so any insight into their, uh, to their war experience is, is very valuable. So that's Japanese destroyer captain by Captain Tamichi Haru. I thought it was really good. I've read it several times throughout the decades. Still five stars for me. So that's our three memoirs for today. I hope you found something there that's uh, interesting. All three of these are obviously still in print. Um, I think you can even get Japanese Destroyer Captain in audio if you're so inclined. And, of course, Unbroken will be everywhere. Audio, print, audio, uh, paperback, hardback. Uh, as I said, the juvenile version. Uh, about the only thing I have seen for it is a comic book. But who knows? That could be coming, too. So, I hope you enjoyed this uh, rendition of World War II books. Where to start? I hope you found something you can read. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Come on back another time. And we'll do it again. This is General George S. Patton, Old Blood and Guts, signing off.